Well, good morning. Well, let's, let's start with some prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you're here. You came with us. You walk among us. You fill us with your presence. And Father, I thank you that you have given us a word for today, a word of comfort and a word of joy. And Father, I ask that you would help me to present the message you've given in a way that we can all hear. I thank you, Father, we have ears to hear and we are able to grasp what you are saying to our spirits. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Some of you don't know me. I'm Elaine Sorensen, and, and uh, I'm so blessed to get to teach because that's what I do. That's, I teach. I don't care what it is, but I'll teach anything. But I most love to teach the Word of God. And today I've got a word, you know, as I was meditating what to speak about today, the Lord took me back to some old familiar verses, and I'm going, well, you know, I don't, maybe you don't do this, but sometimes I discuss things with God, and I go, God, they all know this. This is very familiar. They all know this. And, you know, some of them are just going to tune out. Some of them are just going to be bored by this. And God said, don't be silly. Don't be silly. They're not going to be bored. They're not bored with me. They're not bored with what I have to say. So today, God comes and he wants to comfort you with something old and familiar. But he also wants you to hear it with new ears. Because every time you open up the word, I don't care if it's a verse that you've read a thousand times, the spirit of the living God can speak a new truth to you. And so have your hearts open today to hear something new, because I heard something new as I looked at a very old verse, very, some very familiar verses to all of us. We're going to go into the 23rd Psalm today. And I know you've heard, probably heard dozens of sermons on the 23rd Psalm, but the Lord wants to speak something to you today, so have fresh ears to hear. The 23rd Psalm, and I'm going to read it out of the English Standard Version, but then we're going to go into the Passion Translation, and we'll see something new. So in the, in the English Standard Version, the 23rd Psalm, there's only six verses. It's beautiful. When I was a little girl, my father used to read this every night when we went to bed. So it's, it's very old to me and very precious. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are precious verses for me because... You know, oh, man, it's been, let me see, what is it, 14 years ago? Is it that long? More, maybe more when I was, I was desperately ill. I was dying. I needed a liver transplant. And um, with liver disease comes, sometimes you get all kinds of wacky chemicals and you get uric acid in your bloodstream. And, and you, um, I hallucinated. I lost the ability to read. I mean, I could read, but I would try and read a verse, and I would get through three, set, three words, and then I'd forget where I was. I'd have to start over. It was very hard, very difficult. Couldn't work. But this was something, the 23rd Psalm, that I could get through. And, and all I really, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And at that time, I wanted, there was only one thing I wanted. I wanted to live. And, uh, and here I am. Hallelujah. God's been so good to me. But there are some things, when you look at that verse, the Lord is my shepherd, 
I shall not want. When you look at it in the Passion Version, it's just so beautiful. In the Passion Translation, it says, The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. They, they translate that, my best friend, because the word for shepherd there is the word raha, which is the Hebrew word for best friend. And I really began to meditate on this. You know, what does it mean to be God's best friend? And the first thing I did, like we always do, we Googled. I Googled it, you know. And the things you find when you Google something like that, how do you become God's best friend? Place, site after site after site gave a list. Here's what you have to do. You have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this to be God's best friend. And I, I, <laughs> I ignored it all. <laughs> because there is nothing you have to do to be God's best friend. He is the good shepherd. All of the weight of your friendship is on him. He did everything in his power to make you his friend. He is my best friend. And in a best friend relationship, man, in the natural, a best friend relationship is an effortless thing. If you have to work really hard at a best friend relationship, they're not really your best friend. But a best friend relationship is effortless because you hit that, you meet that person and you just hit it off. And when I think about a best friend, I don't necessarily think about what the relationship I've had with God. And when I began to meditate on what a best friend is, the first thing I think about is fun. And unfortunately, religion has done such a number on us, on the world, that when they think about a relationship with God, they don't necessarily think about fun. But I tell you what, walking with God and having him walk with you is the most exciting, fun-filled adventure you can have. Because God is always, always, always thinking about you and planning ways that he can enhance your life. You know, when you have a good friend, when you have a best friend, you look for ways to bless them. See, you know, I'm blessed. I live with my two best friends. I live with my husband, my sister lives with us. I've got my best friends in my house all the time. And, and in that kind of relationship, you look for ways to bless one another. And that's exciting. And God is looking for ways to bless you. I don't know. It might just be the sunset you saw last night. It might just be a candle you've been looking for. I don't know what it is, but God is looking for little ways and big ways that he can bless you. And when those things come into your life, those little blessings, those little God moments that we all have, man, the trick is recognizing them. The trick is recognizing them. When a blessing comes from God, and saying, man, oh, he did that because he loves me. You know, now we women, you know, you go out shopping and you find just the perfect outfit and it's half price. <laughs> That's a God thing, you know? 
or the new pair of shoes that will go just right with that outfit. That's a God thing. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, my husband would say, well, yeah, prime rib is, you know, 25% <laughs> off. <laughs> it's a God thing. See, the Lord is our shepherd. See, God wants to be our shepherd and our best friend. A shepherd does everything for the sheep. Sheep are pretty helpless. And God compares us to sheep. Because God created sheep without any defenses. Sheep need to be taken care of. My brother used to raise sheep, and he said there are only two kinds of sheep. There's a healthy sheep and there's a dead sheep. <laughs> there's, there's no other kind. And he said they're all stupid. You know, they're all dumb. <laughs> they don't know enough coming out of the rain. They're, they're not very bright. They need to be cared for. And at the time Jesus was teaching this, or you know, the Bible, at the time the, that David would have written this, being a shepherd wasn't easy. Israel was a dry area, and the shepherd really had to do everything. There weren't just, it's not like, um, like the story of Heidi, where the shepherd just takes him out into these lush green mountain pastures. No, it was desert. A shepherd had to go and prepare a pasture. He had to go and pick rocks, and he had to plant seed, and he had to water it so that the sheep would have a place to feed. So he took care of everything. And he defended the sheep. He protected the sheep. He took care of everything. And the sheep, they couldn't find their own food if it was on their own. They couldn't find their own water if it was on their own. They couldn't protect themselves. They were completely dependent on the shepherd. And we are the same way. God created us to be completely dependent upon him. Dependent for all of our spiritual needs. And he delights in providing for all of our physical needs too. He holds everything together. We just saw a little tape at Ginny's the other night about the very cells of our body that are held together by Jesus. By a little, little protein called laminin. It's in the shape of a cross. And that little, little protein holds all of our cells, all of our organs, all of, all of our skin, everything. It holds it all together. Everything's held together by his word. We are completely dependent upon him. If God, for one second, stopped interceding in this world, it would just evaporate. It would just be gone. He holds it all together for us. For us. He doesn't need all of this, but we do. And he holds it all together for us because he's the good shepherd who provides for his sheep. Hallelujah. So God is forever thinking about us. In Psalm 139, verse 17 through 18 in the Passion Translation, it says this. It says, every single moment you are thinking of me. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I awake each morning, you're still with me. You know, it, it, we can't comprehend it, but God is able to have all of us individually on his thoughts every moment. And it's not a little bit of his attention, it's his full attention. 
God's full attention and all of his thoughts are on you because he loves you. How he does it, he's God. That's how he does it. Hallelujah. But it's so true. Psalm 40, verse 5 says, O Lord, our God, no one can compare with you. Such wonderful works and miracles are all found with you. And you think of us all the time with your countless expressions of love, far exceeding our expectations. We need to know God as our Father. You notice it says, the Lord is my shepherd. It doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd. He is your shepherd. He's yours. He watches over you. He protects you. God doesn't say he's a father. He says he's your father. He's your best friend. He knows you individually. He knows everything about you. He knows your likes. He knows your dislikes. He knows your temperament. He knows your every, he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows how many tears you've cried. In fact, he saved them all in a bottle. He knows every time you've talked with anyone about him. He has angels writing down the words that you speak. So that every time you speak of him, it's written down and recorded. That's how important you are to God. He knows you intimately, just like the shepherd. When a shepherd looks out at a flock, he doesn't see a bunch of sheep. He sees Bluebell and Fluffy and, you know, and Hazel. And he knows who their mother was. You know, my, my folks were farmers, and my mom named every one of those calves, you know. <laughs> Man, there was, there was slot machine, <laughs> and, and she had a calf named Jackpot. <laughs> I mean, true, true story. You know, used to drive my dad nuts because she felt bad when they sold them, you know. <laughs> but, um, but see, my dad knew all of his livestock. He knew them intimately. And that's my human father. Think how much more your heavenly father knows you. The word says that the sheep hear his voice. And another they will not follow. You know, the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Because the sheep come to love the shepherd. Because the shepherd loves the sheep. And love begats love. And, you know, there's um, Nicole Moorbach in her book tells a story. There was an impersonator who thought he would try and trick the sheep in a flock. And so he studied the shepherd's voice. He got the inflection. And he had it so it was sounded exactly like the shepherd. And so he tried to call the sheep. It wouldn't come. So he thought, aha. I'll borrow the shepherd's clothes. Then I'll smell like him. Then they'll, then they'll come. So he did. Put on the shepherd's clothes. Called the sheep. They didn't come. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. And another they won't follow. You see, sometimes in our world, there are imposters that dress up like Christ. They put on his clothes. They put on those trappings. And then they speak to us. See, but we're God's sheep. And when the Savior speaks to us, he speaks to us in a way that we recognize. He speaks to us with love. He speaks to us with grace. He speaks to us with acceptance. So when an imposter comes to us, and speaks a voice of condemnation or shame 
or guilt. The better we know the shepherd, the more quickly we'll recognize the imposter and we won't follow those things. It's important for us to recognize what Jesus said in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come to give you life and that more abundantly. See, when Jesus speaks to us, he speaks to us words of life. He speaks to us abundance. He speaks to us with blessing, never cursing. Now the thief, this is how we weigh the things that come into our life, whether they come from God or whether they come from the enemy. Does this voice that's coming at you speak life and abundance? Or is this voice that's coming at you speaking condemnation? and guilt and shame? Is this situation coming to steal from you or kill you or destroy something in your life? Then you know who it's come from. So those are good things to know. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. Ah. See, there's a voice out there, there's a voice that will come to you and try and speak lack over your life. That's not what our shepherd promises us. He promises that you will always have more than enough. In fact, it says in um, Corinthians 9, it says that we'll have enough for ourselves and for every good work. That's a promise from God that you need to take hold of. Connie Witter would say, Lombano that. Take hold of that word. That you have enough for yourself, for your family, and for every good work. So that you're able to give, to sow into the gospel, to sow into other people's lives, so that the Lord is blessed. When you sow into someone's life, it's God who gets the credit. We're his ambassadors. Hallelujah. So, verse 2. Let's move on. Oh, nope, I got to do one more. <laughs> so I talked about, you know, I looked online and they had all these things you had to do to become a friend of God. Scripture's really clear. In James 2.23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, James 2.23, in the King James Version, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What did Abraham do in order to be called the friend of God? He believed. He believed. That's all it takes to be the friend of God. Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in the one that God sent. Believe that God is a good God. That he is for you and not against you. That he loves you. The, the world will teach a God that is fickle that blesses you this time and what doesn't bless you this time. You can never trust what he's going to do. His ways are higher than our ways. Old Testament teaching. New Testament tells us that we have the mind of Christ and that we can know what God is doing. And God said, you're my friends. See, this is the thing. Oh, man, I should read that too. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus was talking to the disciples in John 15, verse 15. And Jesus said to the disciples, and he says this to us, I have never called you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants. And servants don't always understand what the master is doing. But I call you my most intimate friends, for I reveal to you everything 
that I've heard from my father. <sighs> wow. See, there are a lot of teachers out, teaching out there. There's a lot of churches that will emphasize being a servant of God. And I understand why they do it. They read the Old Testament, and that was a wonderful thing to be, a servant of God. But Jesus never called his disciples, and he will never call you his servant. He calls us his most intimate friends. God calls you friend. God calls you son. You know what? You can be friends with your kids. They can be your best friends. And that's what God has chosen for us. God has chosen to be best friends with his kids. Hallelujah. What a wonderful relationship. In the natural, friends can change but not sons. You can't end that relationship. The blood always shows. And in the spirit, the blood always tells. Hallelujah. We are his intimate friends. We are his children. Hallelujah. The Lord is my shepherd and best friend. Verse 2. He gives us rest and peace. That's what he does. Verse 2 in the Passion Translation said, He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. God offers us peace and rest. In the Old Testament times, the shepherd could not always find a quiet pool. And sheep won't drink from a running stream. Have you ever looked at a sheep? They got their mouth right here, and then they got these little slits for a nose. And if they're drinking from a running stream, they are choking. They need a still pool in order to drink. And sometimes what a shepherd would have to do is take big rocks and set up like a, a little dam so that there would be a quiet place in the pool so the sheep could drink and have a peaceful drink. And if sheep are afraid or nervous or scared about anything, they won't eat, they won't drink. So the shepherd had to make sure that the sheep were entirely comfortable. He had to make sure there were no predators around. He had to make sure that it was quiet and peaceful. There was some grass to eat, some nice quiet pool. He had to completely get those sheep in a place of peace with no distractions so that they could eat and they could rest. He would lead them to this blissful place so the sheep could be at peace. And you know, that's what God does for us too. It gets hard in this life that we live right now because we have so many distractions. We got cell phones. We got television. We got snoring husbands. <laughs> so many distractions. The kids, the housework. Oh my goodness. But you know what? For your own sake, for your own benefit, Find some time where you can just sit down and open the word of God and let him speak to you. Where you can find that quiet place. Where you can find that peace for your soul. See, religion would tell us that we always have to be do-do-doing. We have to be striving. We have to, we have to earn the blessings. That's, you know... We have to be a servant of God. We have to be perfect or God's going to be disappointed or he's going to be angry. There's no peace in that kind of religion. There's only peace when we recognize that God 
is a God of grace. His throne is a throne of grace where we can come in our time of need. We can come to God's throne of grace when our lives are all upset. When our life seems like fruit basket upset, we can come to the throne of grace and we can find peace and we can find mercy. We can find acceptance. We can find rest. God is not going to make you jump through hoops in order to bless you. We talked about that. The reason that you can walk in the blessings of God is because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross. It has nothing to do with your behavior. Your behavior didn't go to the cross. Your behavior can't save you. But the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his blood that was spilled, was sufficient to save you and all of mankind if they'll believe. It was sufficient. And in that, recognizing that salvation and righteousness is a gift from God. And Paul goes further. He says, it's a free gift from God. There's no shipping and handling on this gift. Have you ever ordered something like that? You order a free book, but then you got to pay the shipping and handling. Not really free. But salvation and the righteousness of God is a free gift. There's no shipping. There's no handling. There's no service charge. It is free. Free, free, free. God asks nothing in return. What a deal. What do you get? You get the blessings of God that are yours in Christ Jesus. And God gets you. And he said, that's a good deal. God considered that a good deal. Jesus considered that joy. He looked beyond the cross and he saw you and he considered you a deal. He considered you worth the price. You are valuable in the eyes of God. Oh man, I am not going to get through all this. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. God gives us rest. He keeps us safe. Isaiah 26, 3 in the Amplified says, God will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace whose mind, both in inclination and its character, is stayed on you because he commits himself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. So often in this world, we are tempted to look at the problems, especially if you turn on the news. And I could go through a list of problems that the world is looking at today, and I could depress all of you. But you know what? That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to look and focus on the problems of the world. We are told to set our focus on Christ. And when we do that, God will keep us in perfect peace. When we look to Christ and we recognize all that he has done for us, it doesn't matter what trouble is happening around us. Jesus said, you know what, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. There are going to be problems. You know, I don't know. Somehow, I, at one point in my Christian walk, I had the idea that if I was following God, then no problems would come. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. Problems are still going to come into your life. But when problems come, Jesus said, be of good cheer. Cheer up. Be of good courage. Come on. I have overcome the world. I've overcome this. 
I've given you everything you have need of for life and godliness. I provided it. Everything that you need is found in me. As we keep our minds set on God, he has promised that we will have peace. He didn't promise our circumstances would change. But he promised he would be there with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I've walked there, I will fear no evil. Some of you have walked there too. Some of you are walking there now. Yea, though I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, his authority, his authority given to you by Jesus Christ comforts me. That's our comfort in those times of trouble. We have the authority. We have the Holy Spirit. We can speak to our problems and we can say, no, you have no right to bother me. You have no authority over me. I belong to God and Jesus paid the price for this. Jesus paid the price for my healing. Jesus paid the price so that my mind would be strong. He has not given me a spirit of fear. He's given me a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. So tormenting thoughts, you have to go. I have a sound mind. I have the authority of Jesus Christ, his rod and his staff. They comfort me. I'm going to have to teach the rest of this lesson another time. Hallelujah. Because it's so good. It's so good. But this week, this week, I want you to remember that the Lord is your shepherd and he is your best friend. And he has got your back. Always. You know, if you don't know Jesus that way, if you don't know that Jesus is your Savior, then he is for you, not against you, that he is always good. It's really simple. If you want to become God's best friend, it's so easy. We do just what Abraham did. We believe. You believe. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you. Believe that he took your sins away. And ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. And it's a done deal. And he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus Christ is a friend that's closer than a brother. And he's ne he'll, he'll never leave you. See, where religion would tell you that, yeah, well, God is with you until you mess up and then you've broken your fellowship. You can't sin enough to break fellowship with God. You can't. Because the fellowship you have with God is not dependent upon you. The relationship you have with God is dependent on Jesus. And if that covenant can be broken, then there's no hope for any of us. But the blood of Jesus was sufficient to cover all of your sins. Not just cover, to remove all of your sins. And if your sins are removed, then you are free. If your sins have been removed, then Satan can't bring a charge against you. Well, he can try. He can try and bring a charge against you. But in the court of heaven, 
God will look at the record and he will say, oh, this is my kid. Nope, there's no record of any wrongdoing on this person's be- record. Huh. Clean. Hmm. In Christ. Ah, white as snow. Whew. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's salvation. That's what Jesus did for you. Because he's your father. He's your shepherd. He's your best friend. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you loved us, that you love us. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God which is ours in Christ Jesus. Father God, let that relationship sink into us. Father, help us to be aware today and every day that you are always for us, that you are a good God, that you love always, that you're always tenderly caring for us and providing for us and watching over us and protecting us, that we hear your voice, Father, and in others we won't follow. And thank you most, Father, that you said you would never leave us. You never forsake us. Thank you, Father. You are trustworthy and true. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for the food that's been prepared.